Hi guys, Dr. Gillard again. Let's do the GIGU lab for week four. And finally, we're going to move a little further into this abdominal examination. We are going to auscultate the abdomen. Okay, so here we go. So the use of the diaphragm and bell. Of course, you'll be using the diaphragm of the stethoscope to auscultate for bowel sounds and friction rubs. Then you're going to switch over to the bell to look for brewies. Also going to be looking, uh, did I forget one? Friction rubs? Nope, I got friction rubs. And venous hums I could have added in there. Venous hums. Actually, let me make a note. Slide number two. Hums. Venous hums. It's a pan sound going through systole and diastole. We'll talk about it when we get to it. Remember, the auscultation is done before you do palpation and percussion, which is a little unusual. That's not the way the thoracic exam goes. Uh, why? Uh, because we are going to be counting bowel sounds. And we don't, if we poke around in there with percussion and palpation, you might mess up the bowel sounds and you won't have an accurate count. So that is the theory behind that. Pretty straightforward. And so bowel sounds are very widely transmitted. Now here's gonna an eye opener for you. Bates, Seidel, the two board books, and even Jarvis say when you auscultate the abdomen, you only have to do one quadrant. And you can really pick whatever quadrant you want. They none of them say what quadrant. It's not important. Oh my gosh but we do all four quadrants. Well, Seidel says if you're concerned about it, because he can hear professors uh, cringing about this, you can listen in all four quadrants, but the research says it doesn't matter what quadrant you listen, listen in, the bowel sounds are all the same. And you can't tell, the bowel sounds are, they don't tell you anything about where the, that sound is even coming from. Therefore, the only purpose they serve is to listen. Uh, the only thing you can tell about them, bowel sounds, is whether or not the gut is hypoactive, hyperactive, or normal. That's all you can tell. Are there too many bowel sounds? Are there not enough bowel sounds? Maybe they're absent bowel sounds, and people with acute abdomen might have acute, no bowel sounds. So that's it. You can't tell anything about it. Okay, so that's for me, when you auscultate the abdomen, if I give you that, if we're back in class, which I don't think we're going to be, but all you have to do is put the the diaphragm. Remember, put the diaphragm. I like to go in the right lower quadrant, uh, but that's it. You don't have to. If you want to do all four quadrants, you can, but you don't have to. In fact, Seedle is the only one who even mentions. The other board books say you don't do it. Okay. So what are you actually auscultating for? Well, clicks and gurgles. You probably heard them on yourself before. Little little sounds that are made and they have a name and they're exactly called clicks and gurgles. So you have to memorize that. And what what makes clicks and gurgles is not 100% understood. We're not 100% sure what causes them. Uh, but we think it's uh, kind of a wet food being churned around in the stomach or possibly wet fecal material being pushed by peristalsis, uh, that's the best guess of those things, but we're not 100% sure what they are. But what we what we do know is how many you're allowed to hear. It's a big range. So when you auscultate, you only you get your watch out and you count out a minute. And then in your head, you count. Every time you hear a click or a gurgle, one, two, three, four, five, six, you count those clicks and gurgles. And there better, not, there better be at least five, and there better not be any more than 35. Usually there's probably 10 of them or so. Um, but that, if you have, in one minute, if you have five to 35 clicks or gurgles, the examination is normal, and that's it. Right? Have you ever, uh, everybody's heard their stomach growl before. That has a name. That's called borborygmy. I do like that, borborygmy, because you guys don't know it. Uh, so I, that's will probably be on the test. Make sure you know that. Uh, they're very loud. They're and we're not. A, we say it's our stomach, but we're not one hundred percent sure it's the stomach. It's probably the stomach. All right. So 
you examine a patient's abdomen, listening for, or auscultate the patient's abdomen for bowel sounds, and you hear only three bowel sounds in one minute. That is a decreased frequency of bowel sounds. What could that indicate? Well, if the patient has other matching symptomatology, like they're really sick, could mean peritonitis. That's not a good sign. Uh, or it could mean a late bowel obstruction. So bowel obstruction is an interesting little theory. We'll talk about that in a second, though. Uh, but there's a difference. Early bowel obstruction, well, I might as well talk about it now. Did I turn on my... Yes, I did. Okay, so here's a tube. Here is, oh, you'll see. How about your ilium? There's your ilium. All right? And for whatever reason, you get a blockage. Maybe you have, oh, maybe you have some scar tissue. Maybe you had an old tumor growing here. Who knows? Uh, but now you're going to get impaction. You're going to get fecal material causing a beaver dam. And it could be anything. It doesn't have to be this. It could be anything causing a beaver dam. But you have stenosis. Uh, and now you get yourself a small bowel obstruction. So what, what happens? What does, the, what does the intestine do? When, let's see, make it red. So when this just happens, you get hyperperistalsis. Peristalsis tries to push through the blockage. And let's say here's your next piece of fecal material, and it's, now it's stuck. So your peristalsis is really ramping up hard. In fact, you get a crescendo, decrescendo. You can almost get a colicky type of bowel syndrome where the pain hurts so bad, and then it relaxes. And then three minutes, it comes again. Uh, so this is can cause hyperactive bowel sounds because this is very active. However, with the passage of time, this stops and no more contraction. It gives up. As time goes on, it gets slower and slower, and pretty soon it stops. You can actually get, in late obstruction, you can get either diminished bowel sounds or no bowel sounds at all. Uh, so that's kind of the story with that. So decreased frequency could be peritonitis, could be a late bowel obstruction where the bowel is worn out and it's tried to move through the obstruction, but it can't. Okay, and there'd be other signs and symptoms with that, but we'll get to those when the time comes. Uh, peritonitis, of course, is deadly. That's an inflammation and an infection. More important, it's an infection and then the inflammation uh, of the peritoneum and visceral or prioperitoneum, peritoneum, peritoneum, tomatoes, tomatoes. Um, yeah, so you could die from septicemia. I think we've already talked about that. What about increased bowel sounds? Well, I just said one thing is early intestinal obstruction. So another thing could be gastroenteritis is a big one, right? That's probably the most common. You got a bug, you ate something wrong, uh, something had wasn't cooked enough, or uh, you got a, a bacteria or a virus, and it's irritating your stomach. Your stomach is trying to shake it off, trying to, and by doing the only thing it can do to get rid of it is peristalsis. So you get you get too many clicks, and maybe you get fifty, maybe you get a hundred. Well, maybe not. That's probably too much. Um, but yeah, so that's that's clicks and gurgles. That's an increased number of bowel sounds equals an increased number of clicks and gurgles. And it's probably gastroenteritis. Diarrhea, which is probably from the same gastroenteritis, can do the same thing. Or di future diarrhea is on its way. Uh, hunger can increase bowel sounds, but not very long. That Usually your stomach will do that for a few minutes and then that's it. It stops. Uh, so that's not the greatest one. But then we talked about early intestinal obstruction. What about absent bowel sound? That can happen where you get no zero. And to, to make the to make the official diagnosis, you actually have to listen for five full minutes. Okay, five for full minutes. Uh, just to make sure there isn't one errant click or gurgle. And if you don't hear anything in five minutes, even with late obstruction, you probably hear something within five minutes. Uh, but if you don't hear anything, then you have to worry about 
complete intestinal blockage that is very dangerous. It stopped. Uh, and Or it could be another disease called parato- uh, paralytic ileus or adynamic ileus. And it's always paralytic ileus is probably the main one here. And that happens when peristalsis is broken in part of the small bowel. So that can happen after surgery. After you have a surgery, the the peritoneum, the peritoneal cavity is kind of, or the uh, intestine is kind of shocked and in a state of shock, and it doesn't work. So that's actually normal after surgical procedure, but it'll come back. It'll turn on, but not in paralytic uh, ileus uh, with some other type of disease, and we'll get into that more when the time comes. How about some fun facts about bowel sounds? Uh, McGee, who is the, it's not a board book, but it's of all the books, it's super evidence-based and meticulously referenced, really like the book. It should be a board book. But he goes on a rampage about these bowel sounds are just really, I mean, like, like I said, the only thing you can tell is whether they're hyperactive, hypoactive, or not active at all. Okay, so it's impossible to tell where they're coming from. So forget auscultating all the four quadrants. You just need to put the, the diaphragm down in one quadrant. Uh, and that's it. He just reiterates that. Okay, what else does McGee have to say? Uh, bowel sounds are generated by the stomach, large intestines, small bowel. Can't really tell which one or where they're coming from. And the overall frequency could actually increase after a meal. So it's probably not the best time to check for bowel sounds right after somebody ate. And again, the actual cause is still debatable. We think it's the movement of fluid and liquid and gas through peristalsis uh, through the stomach and intestines, but we're not 100% sure. Um, Assuming the frequency of bowel sounds is only fairly accurate, or assessing the frequency of bowel sounds is only fairly accurate in diagnosing small bowel obstruction. So this is about small bowel obstruction. We can't study this in humans. That's inhumane to induce a blockage. We have to use animals. And what I said about the hyperperistalsis, that's from animal research, what I talked about. I think that's all we need to say about that. See, I wasn't very interested in that slide, was I? You People are trying to figure out what I'm going to test you on. One star, just in case I do. But not super interested in that slide. Okay, so again, let's auscultate the abdomen. There's a te- good technique using, looks like the diaphragm there. Remember, now, don't put your finger on top of the bell. Okay, and just stick it in one quadrant. We'll go with the right lower quadrant like uh, Bates is doing. And, yeah, and that's how you do it. And you're going to use the diaphragm, not the bell. We're going to use the right lower quadrant. There's no need to auscultate all four quadrants. I know you were taught that, but it's unnecessary, according to the board book. So why waste the evaluator's time doing stuff that's not recommended? And then listen for the uh, frequency of clicks and gurgles. I'll say on the test, auscultate for bowel sounds. And then you'll know to get your watch ready, and you'll stick the stethoscope there, and you will watch and count. And you'll count how many bowel clicks and gurgles there are within within a minute. And there should be between 5 and 35 of those things. All right, now Bruis is a different animal here. So I might ask you, instead of auscultating for bowel sounds, I might say auscultate for Bruis. And you got to know which ones are auscultatable. Right? We're also, remember Bell and Brewery, they both start with B. So when you're auscultating for Brewies, with the exception of the carotid artery, severe carotid artery stenosis can actually be better heard with the diaphragm. But for, all, for everything else, Brewery use the bell of the stethoscope. The patient's going to be supine, and you're looking for these low pitch Brewies, which are turbulent blood flow caused by something. Uh, Some type of partial beaver dam, like you put your finger over a hose and the water comes flying out of there. Um, That would be a brewery. What could cause a brewery? Atherosclerotic plaque brew up can narrow the lumen and start to cause a partial beaver dam. And the first part of the blood that comes out of the beaver dam is very rapid, even though the volume, overall volume, is decreased. 
Okay? Breweries, unlike bow sounds, are very localized. You can hear, you can tell where breweries are. I'm going to show you the auscultation zones for the renal arteries, uh, for the common iliac arteries, for the abdominal aorta, and the common femoral artery. And if you hear a brewery, you can be pretty sure that they're coming from that structure, although they're still not pinpoint. Maybe coming from something close to that, though. Right? What is it caused by super fast, non laminar, swirling blood? It might be caused from an aneurysm, too, uh, even though there's no stenosis there pinching the blood. Here's a good place to draw a beaver dam for you. So if you have an artery like this and it's all full of atherosclerosis and it's narrowed like that, when you have Mr. Spock's blood is green. So when you have blood flying through here and it hits this nozzle, it comes flying out of here at first. But further on down the road here, there's not a lot of it. So the volume, you can get ischemia from this. But if it's kind of, if it's beaver dammed into a nozzle, it can be very high pressure right here, even though the volume is going to be littler down here. Be good with that? Volume's full blast here. All right. But you can also get a brewery. I mean, if you get, or you can get an aneurysm. So if you have an aneurysm right here, I don't have an erasing tool on this, but if I could erase that, Mr. Spock's blood going in here, the blood's going to go cuckoo in here, and it's going to swirl around because this is moving pretty fast. It's going to go cuckoo, and you can hear that as turbulent blood flow. Uh, so an aneurysm or stenosis, luminal stenosis, they can both cause bruises, right? What causes luminal stenosis? Usually atherosclerosis. Are we good with that? And the aneurysms or the stenosis can be in any of these arteries. I don't know why I just said aneurysm, because stenosis can be in these arteries as well and cause bruises. Probably write that slide down. These are brand new slides. These are only like a couple quarters old. Let's put redo on that one. I can do better than that. All right, and these brewies are typically squirting or pulsatile, like whoosh, 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 uh, because systole it has more punch to it, and that's where you, you have, causes more turbulent blood flow. So you usually you hear it during systole. So where are we auscultating for these? So here's the terminology. You can read that. Leave that slide up. It's better just to go to the slide and show you. Okay, umbilicus, three inches to the midline. Let's just get to the pictures. All right, so here is the costal margin. This is a term that you should know. That's the bottom of the rib cage. Uh, it marks the anterior border of what's that giant hole in here called? That's the thoracic outlet. That's the real thoracic outlet. Okay, so here's your xiphoid process about here. So step one is to auscultate for the aorta. So use the bell. You're going to go right below the tip of the xiphoid, and you're going to favor the left side a hair. So even maybe a little bit more over here. Even if the, even if, because the iliac arteries are going to split down here, even if the aneurysm is down here, the research shows that the spot it refers the sound to is right next to the xiphoid, just a hair to the left. So if the, if the aneurysm is right on top of it, you'll hear it here. If the aneurysm is down here, you'll also hear it here. Pretty good with that? Renal arteries, you're going to do the same thing, only you're going to go out about three inches. Or you could say you're going to go straight out until you bump into the costal margin. Put down the, put down the bell and auscultate. That's the renal artery. That's the right renal artery. That's the left renal artery. Same thing, listening for breweries. Good. Then you're going to go down to the common iliac arteries. All right. So you find the belly button, drop down about one bell length, and then go out about three inches. It's about going to be about in line where that three inches is up there. It's not quite the midclavicular line though. So remember the midclavicular line it would probably be about here. So pretty close to where the femoral artery is. Three inches. 
Okay, everybody's good. Um, and let's hit the femoral arteries while we're down here. Uh, so these these are off maybe a little bit. The anterior superior iliac spine, the pubic tubercle would be right about here. So it might be up a little higher and down. It's probably a little bit more over here. Um, but half where is it? Femoral artery, according to Bates, because different books have different ideas of where this is. We're going with Bates. It's the anterior superior iliac spine, pubic tubercle. If you split that, and of course the inguinal ligament runs along there. If you split that and drop down about a bell length, you'll be right on top of the femoral artery. Are we good? And then the last thing, now this is a rare finding, but they talked about it. So you also want to you auscultate a little circle around the umbilicus, uh, listening for a venous hum. And it's a musical humming, like a like a, like a humming sound. It's rare, uh, but if you hear that, that indicates portal hypertension, right? Probably from a uh, problem with the liver. Cirrhosis of the liver is the number one cause, a beaver dam in the liver, and it backs up the portal system. And you might hear a venous hum even before you find ascites. Okay, so I think I got them all. Let me just make check. I didn't miss any of them. Yep, I got everything I wanted to say. So you can read about that again there. There's the venous hum. It's like a humming musical type sound, quite rare. You could use the, we'll keep using the, the bell, but you could use the diaphragm because they're kind of medium pitched. And a continuous sound, it goes through systole and diastole. You can also hear these in some people in the, uh, in the carotid, uh, common carotid arteries as well, especially in kids. But I think the, you get that in pediatrician, I believe. Anyway, uh, indicates increased portal hypertension, as I said, usually from cirrhosis. What is cirrhosis of the liver? That's another one of these parent, like arterial sclerosis. It's another parent term, and it's got a bunch of things that cause it. The big three are arguably hepatitis C, hepatitis A, and alcoholic and non-alcoholic induced liver diseases. There's an alcoholic alcohol fatty liver disease and a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Uh, but you can just say hepatitis C, hepatitis A, and alcohol overuse. Okay, there's another one. All right. And I think we talked about this already, but abdominal bruise, so they're heard in the epigastric region. Now, you have to be careful. You don't want to scare the patient to death if you hear a brewery because they're actually found in about 12% of normal people, and some studies up to 20%. So you might actually hear one here. Uh, but if you do hear one, regardless, you need to order an ultrasound uh, to further investigate that. You could order a CT if you want, but I would start with an ultrasound for something like that. No radiation with an ultrasound. Lots of radiation with a CT. Uh, abnormal bruises tend to be in patients younger, too, uh, less than 40 years of age. So uh, a lot of Marfans, people with connective tissue diseases, have problems for like uh, with that as well. Hypertension in renal arteries. This is a McGee. So a normal bruise occurs during systole and is medium to low pitch, hence the bell. And Seed recommends the epigastrium. We already said that three inches out. Uh, sound should never spill over into diastole. And patients who have uncontrolled hypertension, here's the key fact of this slide. Patients who have uncontrolled hypertension uh, you, uh, and an auscultory renal artery brewery is, is auscultated, there's about a the huge chance they have renal artery stenosis, likelihood, positive likelihood ratio 39. In other words, they do have renal artery stenosis. So patient has uncontrolled hypertension or it's not controlled well, and you hear a brewery, they got renal artery stenosis. They got a beaver dam, and the down, just downstream from the beaver dam is squirting, and you'll be able to hear that. So huge likelihood ratio on that. Uh, Bruise and other disorders. Uh, so harsh epigastric or right upper quadrant brewery, if you hear one in, in those regions. 
Uh, you can suspect also, in addition to kidney, there could be a liver disease, a tumor, primary tumor or metastatic disease of the liver. Uh, cancer can compress an art, any smaller arteries in that region and cause that. So it's not always a an aneurysm or stenosis of the renal artery. It could be other things if it's in that right upper quadrant. Uh, patients with pancreatic cancer can have bruise in their left upper quadrant from compression of vessels in that region, uh, like the splenic artery runs that way. Um, so you can hear them from other things as well. Friction rubs. Friction rubs, you can Google it. There's all sorts of heart sounds out there. But friction rubs sound like sandpaper rubbing together, a real fine sandpaper. And they're auscultated with a diaphragm because they're high pitch. And they're about six inches from the midline, so farther out than renal artery stenosis. Did I put a picture? Let's zip back. So they would be right about in this region is usually where they're found. Uh, pretty close to the midline is where you can auscultate for friction rubs. Right, sounds like sandpaper, super high pitch. And what do we know about them? They're not, they should never be there. And the presence is thought to be secondary to an inflammation of the peritoneum, peritoneum, whichever you like to say, uh, from things like liver cancer splenic infarction, then that would be on the left side in that same region, uh, or pancreatic carcinoma. So you can get friction rubs on the left from uh, infarcted spleen or a pancreatic carcinoma. On the right, if you get a friction rub, it's almost always liver cancer of some kind. All right, that's a short lab. Hey, we're done. Shortest lab ever. Uh, okay, so I'm probably not going to put a, up a video unless I can get my wife to uh, be the model again, which she's reluctant to do this stuff. Uh, but it's pretty, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. I'll try to get her to do it. Um, but if not, I mean, you can look at those pictures. It's pretty easy. You can also read Bates, right? All right. We'll see you in the next lecture.